believe. And yet we all recognize in others that people are raised Catholic or Baptist, they're, they grow up in this country or that country, and obviously that has a huge influence on their religiosity. But, um, but my point here is that I think um, what I do is concede the point that it does look designed. So people's intuitions are correct in that sense. It, it, eyes are designed to see. Yes, indeed they are. And the wing is designed to fly. Design before Darwin, the natural inference was a top-down architectural-like designer. What Darwin gave us then was a theory to show how the design actually can come about through functional adaptations designed, as it were, by natural selection. Um, and part of the problem here, I think, is, uh, is the, the problem uh, Twain pointed out is that it is just natural to see ourselves as center uh, and special, and, and the design argument, the design inference gives us that sense. Um, the problem is, is I think we are designed, as it were, by evolution to find design in nature. We're pattern-seeking animals. Finding patterns in nature may have an evolutionary explanation. There's a survival payoff for finding order instead of chaos in the world and being able to separate threats to fight or flight. Uh, from comforts to embrace or eat or among other things, which enable our ancestors to, to survive and reproduce. We are the descendants of the most successful pattern-seeking members of our species. In other words, we were designed by evolution to perceive design. So I think it is built in to find connections between things and to infer agency in, in other uh, organisms, like organ, uh, animals that are predators. We infer, it's correct to infer agency and intention that they are intending to do us harm and just make the assumption whether it's true or not, because false positives won't kill you, but false negatives will. So just assume all agents are intentional and out to get you. So the, the, the inference of design and intention and agency is what I think drives uh, animism, spiritualism, polytheism, and even monotheism. I think it's built into the system. It's part of, our, uh, of, of how we were designed by evolution. But there's a deep-seated flaw in this argument, and that this gets directly to the intelligent design theory. Uh, that undermines the entire endeavor. If the world is complex and looks intricately designed, and therefore the best inference is that there must be an intelligent designer, should we not then infer that an intelligent designer must itself have been designed? That is, if the earmarks of design imply that there is an intelligent designer, then the existence of an intelligent designer denotes that it must have had a designer, a super intelligent designer. And by the same course of reasoning, any designer that can create a super intelligent designer must itself be a super duper intelligent designer, and so on. Uh, this is really an important point. If let, Let's say, for example, just for fun, uh, because one of the arguments the intelligent design theorists make is that uh, certain structures are too complex to come up, have come about by a stepwise, gradual Darwinian mechanism. Let's take DNA. Uh, where did DNA come from? Well, we have some ideas it came from RNA. And well, where did RNA come from? Well, this sort of loose, pre-RNA world, the origin of life researchers tell us. We don't really know the answer to this question yet. But let's say we've discovered the answer. Let's say we found something the equivalent of a monolith on the moon, but let's say it's a, a, a little sphere in the Mojave Desert or something. Turns out the whole thing was designed by extraterrestrials. This is not such a far out idea. The great uh, cosmologist Fred Hoyle uh, speculated that life was seeded on Earth through panspermia, whether it was directed panspermia from extraterrestrials or just accidental panspermia from meteorites landing here. Uh, he wasn't sure. But let's say it turned out to be E.T. And uh, let's say aliens came here from Vega, because, you know, that's where Star Trek always sends their uh, aliens from. And uh, let's say we found their sphere with the directions of how to make DNA. Well, the SETI people would be elated because they could get funding from Congress to boost their search for, for extraterrestrial intelligence. And the exobiology people would be elated. They could get bigger grants and so on. This would be terrific. But it still wouldn't answer the question of where DNA come from. comes from. It, it was made by the vegans. Yeah, but where did they come from? Who designed the vegans? And if you say, well, they, they were seeded on planet Vega from some other extraterrestrial. Well, that's very interesting. But where did that extraterrestrial source come from? At some point, we have to have a bottom-up, natural explanation for what, how the whole thing got started in the first place. And so all the intelligent design theorists are doing is saying that we can't figure out how X came about naturally. Therefore, X came about supernaturally, end of story. 
We call this the God of the gaps argument, that wherever there's a gap in scientific knowledge, that is where uh, the intelligent designer uh, operated. So let me pick up the story there. Um, Herbert Spencer in, in 1891 wrote, those who cavalierly, cavalierly reject the theory of evolution as not adequately supported by the facts seem quite to forget that their own theory is supported by no facts at all. So it's one thing to say that I can't figure out how X came about and I'm not buying your natural explanation, you Darwinians or you Neo-Darwinians or whoever. Uh, this is just an argument from personal incredulity, as Richard Dawkins calls it. It's, it's just saying, I can't figure it out. Well, maybe you haven't figured it out yet because you're not smart enough, or maybe you haven't done the homework yet. Maybe you should roll up your sleeves and get to work and see if you can figure it out rather than giving it up. Um, and, um, and, and that's what it comes down to. So, for example, why does no one make this argument? And since we have Mr. Wells with us here, Dr. Wells with us here, perhaps he'd like to answer some of these questions I'm going to pose now. Um, this is comparable to the plane problem of Isaac Newton's time. The planets all lie in a plane, the plane of the ecliptic, and revolve around the sun in the same direction. Newton found this uh, arrangement to be so improbable that he invoked God as an explanation at the end of his magisterial work, Principia Mathematica. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So why don't the intelligent design theorists quote the great Sir Isaac Newton, who was a believer, uh, a deeply religious man, who wrote more about theology than science? Why, why would they not make that argument? And the answer is because that gap has been filled. We know how planetary systems form from condensing clouds of interstellar gas. As they, gravity takes over, they begin to condense. They begin to spin. As they begin to rotate and spin, they flatten out into a disk. So the gap has been filled, in other words. The problem with chasing the gaps is where does your theory go when the gaps are filled? Because science uh, is not just a process of looking for uh, gaps. It, it is, but that's only the start of a research program. The whole point of looking for gaps is to find a, a place to do new research. So the program that the intelligent design theorists propose is just gap seeking. No gap filling. There's no research that I've been able to find in which they say this is what we think the explanation is for X, other than we think an intelligent designer did it. So for example, I, I would love to know uh, from Dr. Wells uh, if, if we had the opportunity, if he had the opportunity to teach intelligent design in a public school biology class, let's say it's 10th grade biology, it's the unit on genetics, you got two weeks to teach about genetics. What are you going to teach? Well, DNA is too complex to come about from RNA. I can't see any stepwise Darwinian mechanism of how it can come about. Therefore, we think an intelligent designer designed DNA. All right, well, let's see, that took all of about 20 seconds. You still got two weeks to fill of the unit. What are you going to do? Well, turn to science, of course, and, and, and that's my point. There's no science here. It's perfectly legitimate to criticize uh, evolutionary uh, biology. It's done all the time. If you go to any conference of evolutionary biologists and evolutionary theorists, they're going at it, tooth and nails. These, you got to be thick-skinned and tough-minded to survive in science. It's very skeptical. They're very critical of each other. I heard Lynn Margulis stand up there at a conference and, and proclaim she is not a neo-Darwinian and she's not going to be bullied by those neo-Darwinians and so on. She went on and on promoting her own particular theory of symbiogenesis, which is sort of this non-Darwinian mechanism of the origin of complex cells. But, but that's all still within the normal boundaries of how science is done. Not just reading journal articles to find where the gaps are, but taking the gaps and filling them. So my criticism of intelligent design theory is at the very moment where it gets really interesting, where we can't quite figure something out, this is where these guys quit and they say, beats me, I don't know, I think, you know, a miracle happened or the designer did it or something like that. Well, instead of that, why don't we roll up our sleeves and get to work like Lynn Margulis did and, and see if you can test the hypotheses. So, uh, this is the problem with string theory is having right now as, a, as an analogy. Uh, it's not giving us any testable hypotheses. And even though string theory is conducted within the normal bounds of science, with the scientific community at major institutions like Caltech and MIT, these guys are still coming under the gun, as you've seen in recent books, because they're not giving us anything testable. They're, at some point, you have to come into contact with reality, the empirical world. And, and until you do, then it's not really science. <clears throat> 